Good morning, everybody. A very warm welcome to this fourth edition of Online Data Science Masterclass organized by Analytics India Magazine in association with ISP Institute of Data Science. Today we have with us uh, three uh, renowned industry and academia speakers to take the session for you all. First up, we would have Mr. Shubhashish Manna. He is the head of HSBC Global Analytics uh, Center across India, China, as well as Poland. And then uh, we would have Professor Sudhir Walti. He is the Associate Professor and Associate Dean Faculty Assignments and Register Office at Indian School of Business. And finally, we would have Mr. Jaydev Tatta. He is the Director, Analytics and Cognitive Competency Leader, Robotics and Intelligent Automation at Deloitte. And he's also an alumni of AMPBA program from Indian School of Business. So without much further ado, I would like to commence today's masterclass with our first speaker, Mr. Shubhashish Mana. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning, sir. So it's really great to have you as uh, our industry speaker for uh, today's session. And uh, before uh, we, uh, you know, really commence the session, it, uh, I, I would like to really thank you for accepting our invite at uh, the last moment. And it's really great to have you uh, as our uh, industry speaker for today's session. So I would like to begin uh, today's session by asking you, you know, to take us through uh, your college days and you know what sort of interested you towards this uh, domain of analytics and data science right so so at the outset, uh, outset let me kind of thank you uh, for having me here i think it's a great initiative uh, and i would like to uh, really thank and congratulate the analytics india magazine uh, this is a great initiative now um, uh, see college days were the golden days right uh, so uh, see th this uh, interest in analytics uh, uh, came uh, from uh, the love for mathematical sciences. Uh, so I did my uh, bachelor's in statistics from Ramakrishna Mission Residential uh, College, uh, Narendrapur, uh, which is uh, under Calcutta University. Then I did my master's in statistics from IIT Kanpur. And then I have done a postgraduate certificate in business management from XLRI Jamshedpur. So um, I have been very lucky. I've been very lucky to have some of the stalwarts of the subject teaching us there. And uh, they really didn't uh, stop in uh, the mundane theorems and lemma. They actually uh, took to the practical application of some of these concepts in uh, various aspects, be it forecast, be it uh, statistical quality control, estimation, and things like that. And that actually um, aroused the uh, kind of interest uh, that I had. So what, what really fascinated me in the world of statistics is that these complex theorems, uh, which is uh, uh, kind of uh, full of uh, say chi, uh, mu, tau, right? All sorts of Latin uh, letters, very complex uh, to comprehend uh, in, in general, had such uh, great applications in real life. And uh, that's the love uh, for uh, that uh, mathematical uh, science and the curiosity of its application in day to day life that really kind of uh, uh, brought me uh, to the data science profession. Great, great. That's really interesting point that you made about love towards statistics and mathematics. So uh, I think uh, you started off with the right education background, and I think that that sort of propelled you towards uh, you know, liking this sphere, uh, liking this domain, in fact, uh, given the right uh, set of uh, subjects that you picked up uh, for your uh, future education. So uh, that, that's a very good point. And uh, I, I would also, also like to know, you know uh, what typically uh, happens uh, at the Global Analytics Center uh, which you manage at HSBC and you know uh, how crucial is it for a large financial organization such as uh, your your company right so um, global analytics centers is uh, basically uh, set across uh, various countries uh, India we have a couple of centers uh, we have in uh, Guangzhou as well as in Krakow in Poland uh, so this is basically a team of advanced analytics uh, professionals who are working on various uh, business problems across all our global businesses and global functions. So uh, this team actually works on cutting edge tools and technologies, uh, innovative methodologies in solving different business uh, problems across uh, different domains of the banking, be it marketing, risk, finance, or even compliance. So uh, this team um, actually is uh, solving different 
uncharted problems um, with the help of uh, technology and data as well as data science. The whole mandate is to bring data engineering, data science and technology together to solve business problems, to create value uh, for uh, our shareholders, our um, customers, uh, as well as keeping our regulators happy because there's a lot of focus on regulatory projects as well. As you can understand, banking is a pretty regulated domain and a lot of uh, our focus is also on the regulatory aspects. So for a, for a uh, company as diverse and as large as HSBC, it is uh, uh, basically uh, the kind of driving force uh, uh, in order to take decisions. And the Global Antic Center is at the center of building the data science capability for the bank uh, across the group. So this is basically a group capability that we are building. This is the competency that we're building uh, for uh, the future of the bank. So this is to transform the bank for the better. So that's what Global Analytics Center does. Okay, okay, that's that's great, that's great. And it really highlights how crucial data analytics, uh, you know, plays for a large uh, financial organization, especially dealing with the huge quantities or huge volumes of uh, data for its day-to-day uh, -day services that offers to your uh, customers, right? Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think I, I would like to uh, move on to my next question on, you know, uh, the whole analytics domain itself, right? So uh, you have been uh, in, in this domain from uh, as early as 2000, uh, no, 2020, uh, sorry, uh, 2000, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, I would like to hear from you as to how do you think this domain has evolved over these past two decades? And also, you know, uh, how does it uh, look now uh, uh, when you compare it 20 years back? How, how do you think it has evolved and how has things that's changed? A good, that's a, that is a pretty uh, interesting question. So it actually is very nostalgic. Uh, so I, I have been a campus hire uh, 20 years back, right? I, I started my uh, kind of career uh, in uh, analytics and uh, I haven't really found a reason to, to change my domain. It's so interesting. So uh, within a blink of an eye, 20 years have gone. So uh, if I really be honest, there has been a huge change. There's a huge uh, change in the whole industry. Uh, I see the uh, problems have become much more sophisticated and uh, things have really uh, improved uh, because of the proliferation of data, right? So now um, uh, we actually have access to various kinds of data. Uh, say, for example, social media data is, is pretty uh, actively used nowadays. Uh, in uh, uh, those days, 20 years back, perhaps uh, that was uh, not the reality. So uh, the, the business problems have become more complex because the customer requirements have changed. The uh, okay. regulatory environments have changed. Uh, plus also, I think the technology space is uh, changing very, very fast. Uh, and that is why uh, we as data science professionals need to keep ourselves uh, up to date with respect to these changes that's happening. And uh, we need to ensure uh, that uh, we are actually on the top of the game. Now, see, if, if you really take this to uh, some of the other domains, right, like fraud or uh, say financial crime and things like that, you need to uh, be smarter than the fraudsters in order to kind of mitigate those uh, strategies. So 20 years, uh, has really passed like a, a blink, but uh, I think uh, uh, the business problems have really become more complex. Uh, the availability of data has increased. Um, that's what a huge difference uh, that I see. However, I think um, one more welcome change that I see is that there are enthusiasts from different various other fields who are also kind of getting interested to practice data science and they're coming and adding a lot of value to the domain uh, beyond the traditional fields of economic statistics. So that's a welcome change that I see. Okay, okay. So you spoke about uh, uh, people from other verticals also being interested in this domain, right? right. Uh, so yeah, can you name a couple of them as to where exactly is the source of this additional uh, manpower or interest that's generated? Yeah, so I, I, I see I see a lot of people from, uh, say, uh, engineering background, people who are uh, where it's supposed in um, um, health care, health um, professionals, they are also kind of uh, coming in um, people from retail background uh, also coming in and uh, practicing data science. See, see uh, the kind of uh, stuff that we're seeing in the e commerce. Uh, so that's yeah. a pretty uh, new domain. Uh, where we see a uh, application of uh, data science, the transport, the entertainment industry, 
so uh, see the Uber, Ola, or even even say uh, the Netflixes of the world uses uh, pretty sophisticated data science uh, technologies. So that's pretty interesting, uh, and it is enriching uh, the domain. That's a very welcome change. Okay, okay, that's really great, great to know, sir. Uh, and my next question uh, would be on, you know, uh, you know, I, I think you meant you touched upon few domains, but uh, specifically, uh, which domains do you see data and analytics will play a critical role going forward? That is uh, starting 2020 onwards. Uh, do you uh, do you do you foresee any new industry verticals that you could that would see a major transformation using analytics and data science? Yeah, so so it's a, it's always difficult to predict the f uh, future, but I, I think uh, see data science is actually helping us uh, to take much more smarter decision and uh, make sense of this huge uh, new uh, oil which is called data, right? And uh, yeah. the proliferation of data, uh, the the humongous increase in data both in velocity volume right it's everywhere um, every aspect uh, there is data which we need to mine and make sense of so so that's where uh, i see that most of the domains be it transport be it uh, say healthcare be it uh, even defense right uh, banking insurance everything uh, will see a lot of uh, increased application of data science however i feel uh, that uh, some of these niche um, areas like say fraud cyber uh, crime um, money laundering um, i am talking about financial crime related stuff uh, those uh, along with say surveillance uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, stuff will actually see more application of data science uh, because uh, that's where uh, you can really um, um, make an impact uh, by doing these uh, smart algorithms however if you really want to kind of uh, talk about a uh, really brand new area where data science can create a uh, real value this is my personal opinion right so i feel that the climate risk change right um, is going to be uh, pretty important so so the climate change and the risk associated with that is going to have a lot of application of data science going forward that's my personal opinion though yeah yeah i mean i would agree to that point uh, you know given the seriousness of pollution and its impact on the overall health of you know uh, the human population itself uh, i'm sure and it has a uh, chain reaction uh, it will actually actually impact uh, most of the other industries too true true absolutely absolutely on, on that point uh, how do you think uh, the role of data science or analytics uh, would be on say uh, for example pharmaceutical industry who are now you know uh, on their toes to come up with uh, a vaccine for uh, the covid-19 virus yeah, so so that is going to be pretty crucial, right? So so if I'm not wrong, I learned uh, recently that see Oxford University is almost at the uh, kind of uh, verge of uh, identifying a vaccine, and they're starting the clinical trials. Uh, and hopefully by September or end of the year, they are pretty hopeful that they will be able to uh, bring our vaccine. They have already started uh, kind of uh, manufacturing um, a million doses of it, uh, even. Uh, before the clinical trial because they're pretty confident. However, the clinical trial is nothing but design of experiments, which is basically data science. So so the right. application of data science in healthcare is going to be pretty crucial. And, and as things are becoming more complex day by day, uh, it is going to be pretty important. See, it's not only about physical health. As uh, life is becoming complex, mental health is becoming pretty important, right? And some of these yeah. clinical experiments uh, that happens um, even on the mental health front is uh, going to be pretty important true true absolutely absolutely i mean uh, in fact uh, we can already see uh, the pity that uh, some of the workforce that we are experiencing because of the current work from home situation while many uh, did dream about having this work work from home option uh, <laughs> early back then but it's sort of a double-edged sword right because it's difficult yeah. for one to even uh, do that normal uh, routine of work uh, considering that you are in a home setting and you have to uh, adjust a lot within that uh, environment sure. right uh, right so i would like to move on to my uh, next question now uh, this is to do with uh, you know a skills or rather let's put it as an aptitude uh, that uh, one would require uh, or one is required to have uh, to begin their career in data science or analytics domain what do you think uh, you would probably look out for and what actually worked well for you in your case? 
Right. Uh, see, uh, like any other domain, the basics are uh, the most important. The foundation is the most important. I think uh, your uh, understanding of basic mathematical uh, concepts so that you are able to use algorithms, so that is uh, going to be pretty fundamental. And your ability to code, your uh, kind of programming skills, computer programming skills, is going to be pretty key. So if you don't have uh, that... Uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, attitude to kind of learn uh, into the depths of quantitative concepts or you are uh, not interested in uh, programming then perhaps this is not your cup of tea so so those two are pretty fundamental requirements uh, to uh, do well in uh, data science uh, domain along with that i think uh, your uh, concept of uh, uh, cloud infrastructure is going to be uh, pretty handy because most of the deployments nowadays are happening in uh, cloud. Uh, your ability to kind of clean up data uh, and your ability to manage large volumes of data. When I say clean up data, clean up data in such a way that you don't uh, lose much of information value. Because in your cleaning up, if you lose the information value, then uh, your model is as good as uh, what you are uh, putting in there, right? So, so that's going to be a, a pretty smart document, how you kind of uh, manage large volumes of data. So uh, along with that, uh, you need to be kind of uh, very collaborative and uh, open. You need to be kind of um, learning from the best practices and the mistakes of others. Uh, that's pretty important. Uh, and uh, uh, you need to be kind of uh, in uh, sync with the industry trends that's happening. You need to be kind of uh, uh, looking into what's happening in academia, what's happening in industry. Uh, so that's going to be pretty important as well uh, for you to be kind of uh, uh, on top of the wave uh, because uh, things are uh, changing very fast, right? In, in a couple of months, uh, new technologies come in and you need to be kind of uh, on top of it. So that's what I will say is uh, the basic kind of uh, requirement for anyone to uh, kind of come into data science. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, and and follow and my next question would be you now what are some of the best practices that uh, you as an individual follow uh, or have have followed that has helped you to excel within uh, you know the data, uh, domain of data science is there any few examples that you could possibly share with our audience yeah so i i really don't know whether these are best practices or not things uh, when i really introspect that what are the things that uh, really help me uh, i can Perhaps share uh, some of those. I think uh, yeah. your your kind of uh, inner zeal for continuous learning is pretty important. You need to be kind of uh, focused on continuous learning on new age tools and technologies. That's uh, going to be pretty key. Your uh, ability to kind of uh, or, or the mindset to challenge the status quo, uh, trying out new solutions uh, uh, as champion challenger. That uh, I think uh, has been a pretty key. Uh, aspect uh, in uh, how you kind of uh, progress within this domain because uh, you really uh, need to continuously uh, challenge what is the uh, champion with the challenger concept. So that's uh, in my mind has been uh, pretty important. Um, I think uh, from your own uh, um, attitude perspective, you should not uh, really shy away from uh, uh, failure because your ability to apply your learning is going to be key. And, and if there is failure, you exactly know that this is one of the way of not getting it. It doesn't uh, really mean anything else, right? So, so that uh, mental uh, maturity yeah, is, I think, uh, pretty important for you to kind of keep going. Um, overall, I think uh, you need to be kind of uh, looking into what's happening uh, in the outside world. What I mean is that there has to be a outside in view uh, in your approaches, uh, what's happening in academia, what are the new trends coming in, in the industry, what are the new tools, techniques uh, which are being talked about, uh, what are the new kind of uh, um, tools, be it in data visualization, be it in uh, machine learning, which are being uh, used. So looking into uh, a couple of papers uh, at your leisure, understanding what's uh, the new concepts being talked about, those have been pretty handy, uh, I will say. So uh, these are uh, really the basic uh, of my experience, uh, which really helped me. Okay, that's an interesting point that you made. Uh, so I think my next question would be, you know, uh, what kind of advice you would give for the current data science uh, professionals 
or aspiring data science professionals who want to enter into this field you know considering that uh, you know the current economic situation and you know what people are talking about uh, job losses etc right but there's still a, a, a lot of uh, people who want, who aspire to get into this data science sphere right so how, how do you how how do they keep themselves motivated in the current economic scenario? Yeah, no, that that that's a um, very important question. Thanks for asking that. See, COVID nineteen situation is a temporary one, right? So even if we suppose go six months uh, back, I think uh, um, data science uh, uh, used to be one of the uh, hot fields, and I I, I really believe that uh, this is one field which is uh, pretty promising uh, in future as well. And uh, that we are doing a master class amidst this lockdown is a testimony of that uh, high potential of this domain, right? So that should speak for itself. Um, the applications of data science is going to be manifold in various industries. So uh, this uh, pandemic situation due to COVID-19 is unprecedented. I think uh, uh, no one has seen this kind of an impact. Uh, perhaps this is going to create a little bit of a recession as well. Having said that, yeah. there may be some uh, impact uh, on some of these industries adversely, but uh, there may be a possibility that some other industries will uh, kind of uh, have a, a relatively uh, better opportunity. So I was actually looking uh, into uh, some of these uh, uh, news articles, and I just learned that in China, uh, mm -hmm. one of the services that post COVID-19, some of the industries of which uh, perhaps will do relatively better are uh, industries like uh, say uh, live streaming platforms um, healthcare medical uh, internet services data services uh, a little bit of software uh, technology uh, so these are industries uh, which perhaps will do a little better that's the survey talks about so uh, it's not that uh, it is going to impact uh, all the industry so we need to kind of stay focused uh, focused and uh, uh, kind of own up uh, the art of data science and uh, wait for the right opportunity of our own interest uh, to make the next, most out of that. Okay, okay, that's really good to know. Uh, that it's bring good to have a perspective that data science would, would continue to remain and continue to grow strong uh, irrespective of what the current uh, situation is. Uh, I, I would like to uh, I would like to ask you one last question, uh, uh, more more uh, pertain to your organization. Uh, if you could give us a glimpse of uh, you know uh, HSBC as an organization and uh, specifically the Global Analytics Center, what, what's a typical day like for you uh, at your organization? Well, as I was telling you, uh, Global Analytics Center yeah. is uh, basically a, a knowledge hub uh, of uh, uh, advanced analytics professionals, data scientists, and a yeah. typical day would mean uh, um, uh, getting into office uh, and uh, uh, understanding what is the business problem that uh, which is on plate. Then uh, we actually get together uh, in uh, agile pod structure, uh, kind of. Uh, distribute the problem break the problem uh, in, in uh, kind of uh, legitimate uh, way uh, across our uh, teams uh, as i was talking about uh, we are uh, actually bringing the data technology and analytics together we work in uh, agile pod structure understand what is the requirement uh, work very closely with our stakeholders to understand the business uh, uh, nuances and the business requirements and then uh, work on solutions then uh, uh, it's a very collaborative approach uh, between business and the uh, data science community. Uh, we work together uh, in order to create a solution and then go back to business um, with the, with the uh, final uh, output. Uh, so that's what a typical uh, day looks like. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, the point that you made about uh, aligning a technology with business outcome, I think it's very crucial for any organization. And I'm sure uh, the Global Analytics Center at HSBC has excelled uh, over the years and with leaders like you, I'm sure it would continue to thrive. So uh, I, I would like to thank you for answering those questions and uh, you know, I, I would request you to kindly uh, stay back. Uh, we would have sure. a, a brief uh, Q&A towards uh, the end of the session. So folks, thank uh, you so much. Uh, yeah, thank you, thank you, Mr. So, uh, so folks, we would have our uh, next uh, speaker for this session. Uh, it would be uh, Professor uh, Sudhir Varti from uh, Indian School of Business.
Mr. Sudhir, uh, if you could hear us. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We, we are okay. able to hear you now. I've shared my screen. Can you tell me if it's visible? It should be a full PPT. Uh, One second. Now it's yes, now it's visible. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. So I will just take this to uh, the PPT slide show. Yeah. Is this yeah. better? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Sir. Wonderful. Wonderful. Let me get started in that case. Uh, all right. So let me get started then. Uh, well, uh, morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Sudhir Valeri, uh, and uh, let me uh, start off with uh, the AMPBA Masterclass Series. Uh, well, the AMPBA uh, offered by ISB is uh, one of the, if not the most comprehensive uh, data science courses, certainly in terms of content coverage and the uh, amount of time spent among its contemporaries. So let me get started with this right away. Okay, so let me start off with the age of data. What I'm going to show you next, folks, is basically a, a simple quotation, yeah? But let's see where it leads to and where it takes us, yeah? yeah. The age of data, yeah, data science and hence data. So here is a simple quotation, yeah? If land was the primary raw material of the agricultural age, what does it mean? The agricultural age is pre-industrial, right? What does it mean that land was the primary raw material? It meant that pre-industrial era, if you wanted more agricultural produce, the only way to do that was to have more land, period. I mean, there was really no other way to do this, yeah? And iron, the primary raw material of the industrial age, well, what does that mean? It means that in the industrial era, if you wanted more industrial product, the only way to do that was really to have more iron and more steel. That's basically it. Yeah, industrial era would be uh, starting somewhere about 200 odd years ago. Yeah, and of course we are now in the third era, the information age. Yeah, and the data is the primary raw material of the information age. Yeah, seems like a simple enough quotation, but hold on to this. I'm going to revert back to this. Okay, after a few slides, we'll cycle back here and we will look at the implications of what this may mean. All right. So let me start by motivating this whole thing with an example. Yeah, I was hoping there could be a little more interaction, but I'm not sure if that is uh, going to be feasible in this format. So I will just uh, ask a question and answer it myself, I guess. All right. Consider the stock performance of Amazon versus Walmart. Amazon is in red and Walmart is in blue. I'm guessing everyone is familiar with these companies. So Walmart is a US-based uh, retailer, the largest offline retailer in the US. Annual revenues, $400 billion. Hmm. Okay, so this is a chart hmm, uh, which shows the stock performance of these two companies. So this red one, the red line is Amazon, the blue line is Walmart. They were at different levels, but at our starting point, I'm gonna equate them both to level 100. And then what follows, is how much they varied with respect to that starting level, yeah? So the series here starts in February 2012. Walmart's valuation in Feb 2012 was $200 billion. Amazon's was about $82 billion, yeah? So they both are starting at level 100 here, yeah? What happens five years later, February 2017? Walmart is a 210 billion. Walmart is pretty much where it had started. Not much movement, almost the same. Yeah, but Amazon jumps to 400 billion dollars in valuation. Okay, this is almost 5x. Yeah. Now, even if you say, oh, but that is because of AWS. Even if half that performance is attributed to cloud, even then, that's a 2.5x jump. You're talking 150 percent increase in the net value of the company. You know, valuation being what the company is likely to earn over its lifetime. Okay, we're talking profits as opposed to you know, earnings in this case would be profits. So there it goes. Which brings up the question, why? Yeah. Why is the performance so different technically? Don't know retailer, both of them are retailers, right? So why is one, I mean, performing so differently from the other? Well, let's have a look at this, yeah, in some sense. The answer, of course, yeah, 
tangentially related to data science, no longer tangentially, I guess, is basically the availability of data. Yeah. And what can be done with that data, the analytics piece that goes with that data, and the additional value that could potentially be derived from that data, and thereby that difference, that difference is 150%. I mean, not considering cloud. Yeah. Otherwise, it would be 400%. There you go. Okay, cost of lost opportunity. Okay, there's another famous example in business, but let me walk you through it. The whole idea is to set the stage for where data science and business analytics enter the picture. Yeah. The year is 2000. Yeah, this is the turn of the century. And there is this company called Blockbuster. I'm not sure how many of you may have heard about it, but Blockbuster was the leading video rental chain in the US. Yeah. And they had shops in pretty much every, uh, every county in the States. Yeah. And they, they, so this was offline video renters. You would actually come with higher DVDs and before that it was video cassettes, right? Blockbuster had decades of legacy, yeah? Now in 2000, Blockbuster had the opportunity to buy out this upstart company called Netflix, which was also in the DVD video rental business, which was using US Post at that time to mail its uh, uh, DVDs, yeah? We know what Blockbuster did. Blockbuster said no, yeah? What follows, is well history but there it is yeah this chart here shows you revenues so we're talking revenues in this case 2004 to 2010 between blockbuster and netflix okay if you look at the blue line yeah 2004 it dips a little to 2005 yeah now if you're a blockbuster you might have thought oh well this is yeah ups and downs in business it's just a business cycle nothing to worry about and then between 2005 and 2006, the rate of dip kind of slows a little, which is, hey, good news, right? Maybe it will pick up next year. That doesn't happen. The dip continues at a slightly slowing rate all the way until 2008. 2008, of course, we had the Lehman crisis and all of that. But what does that have to do with video rentals? 2008, the decline takes a sharp, sharp, Turn downwards and 2009 it just falls off a cliff by the way 2008 itself is too late and I would argue 2004 5 6 itself was too late for blockbuster their bankruptcy was pretty much inevitable by the way notice Netflix in rent it does not go by I mean does not exceed blockbusters revenue they are not the same size yet okay in fact, they cross revenue of uh, uh, you know Blockbuster around the time Blockbuster is close to bankruptcy. That's when basically you see the two lines intersect. Yeah, but there's something fundamentally different about Netflix, and we'll come to that right away. Yeah, we'll also see how analytics plays into it. Cut to 2017. Netflix was worth 61 billion dollars. Today, it's you know about 150 billion dollars. Actually, this is last year, 2019. I don't know. Right now, after you know, for what, pandemic and so on, it would probably be much higher. Yeah. How high? Well, let's see. Netflix is market cap greater than Disney's and Comcast. So Disney is well, we know Disney, right? I mean, vast properties in terms of you know entertainment and uh, uh, copyright properties, and Comcast is the biggest uh, U.S. Uh, cable provider, right? Netflix is market cap, market cap being the firm value greater than disney and comcast put together disney of course is now challenging netflix by getting into its business understandable but let's see where all of this is going yeah where am i headed with this as a data scientist folks you look at this chart what companies are doing now and asking data scientists is this if my revenue dipped just a little does it mean i am on this 2004 2005 curve will there be a steep drop off next year or the year after if you can predict what will happen to my revenues, tell me now. I want to know whether we are on this doomed trajectory or not. Okay. The kind of predictive questions that our data scientists are now being faced with. The kind of questions that high-flying consultants would have answered in the last century, but today people are turning increasingly to data and algorithms. We'll have a look at that. Yeah. Okay. Now let me go back to the original code. Folks, are you following me? I have no way of knowing, okay? All I have is a screen and I'm talking into a mic. Okay, ouch. All right, so what do we have here? Well, let's see. 
the age of data yeah the same quotation again yeah and you might say okay nice quotation but does it have any practical significance folks question to everybody out there what is the practical significance of this quotation how does it in some sense yeah what does it mean that data is the primary raw material of the information age a lot of our economy is still stuck in the agricultural and industrial ages yeah what does it mean the data is the primary raw material of the current age how can it help extract value for firms enterprises businesses and people working in the industrial and the agricultural sectors okay yeah fair question let's have a look at that right i'm going to rephrase that question okay we want to make it a little more broad based yeah how many of our present day laws institutions societal norms and governance structures actually derive from the agricultural age or the industrial age can i go to we are in the information age today but guess what most of our present day institutions societal norms governance structures legal infrastructure is actually built for derived from meant to service the industrial and agricultural sectors what does that imply for data scientists where will the value creation come from in these sectors for data scientists yeah let's have a look at that take the agricultural age agricultural age practices and norms are the bedrock for all property laws everywhere in the world today property law actually derives from the agricultural era questions and issues the idea was to preserve land in some sense keep it within the family inheritance laws right who inherits land all of that was codified in the first time and then you know over time it has changed but still it is largely the assumption behind property laws today is that it deals with something as immovable and as precious and as irreplaceable as agricultural land yeah there it is okay family law also derives from the agricultural age again this had to do with you know how in some sense inheritance and property etc were divided yeah and would be passed down yeah tax laws also derive both from property and family law of course in india agri income is not taxed but in most of the world tax laws actually were framed for taxing agri products I and mean, that's basically how it all came through yeah so what does it mean is there an opportunity for current day data scientists to crawl through this and find opportunities for arbitrage maybe opportunities to do things better improving productivity efficiency make more money yup we'll have a look at that yeah hold on land acquisition issues all issues relating back to the agricultural age today we know that in india land acquisition is a big issue yeah basically these are holdovers of the agricultural era yeah so imagine land records on the web a huge issue it's been started in karnataka and i'm hoping that in some sense other states will follow suit but once this happens now this is in some sense the intersection of the digital era yeah and assets of the agricultural age yeah, which basically frees up those assets in some sense which which gets them to sweat a little more which actually gets them to be more productive yeah so somebody could use land as collateral somebody in some sense could use it for credit access to credit being by economists one of the big reasons why i mean i'm getting more into the economics and business side but you can see where in some sense digitizing something can have so much of impact yeah all right what about the industrial age how many of our present day laws institutions societal norms and governance structures actually derive from the industrial age yeah well not a surprise there company law effectively actually derives all securities laws most of today's financial markets effectively the laws that deal with them belong to the industrial age I and mean, that's where it all comes from yeah even in high finance right now you might think hey that would be well we will see right the information age when it meets the industrial age yeah what are these areas of intersection where can value be created and deployed hmm? we'll have a look at that hold on yeah which of course brings me to the third piece yeah the information age itself so let me get there data story and history well this is kind of old hat by now but i'll go through it just in, you know, just for completeness sake so you have the three famous v's of big data right volume variety and velocity yeah so this i heard a few years back right and the time it takes you to read this sentence 6 seconds on the for the average reader 
Google receives half a million queries from around the world. I was shell shocked to hear that. Right? Turns out that this includes uh, Google Map things, uh, and hence kind of makes sense in that sense. Yeah. So there it is. In 2000, digitally stored data was a mere 25% of all data generated. By 2007, okay, 2000 was not so long ago. I mean, at least for an oldie like me, okay, I remember 2000. It was just the other day, seems like. And I was in college then. Digitally stored data was a mere 25% of all data generated. By 2007, something fundamental changed. That proportion jumped to 94%. It hasn't fallen since. The school still stress pencil paper. Okay, a lot of data being created there is still pencil paper, but almost everywhere else, most of the new data generation is happening directly digitally. Yeah, and this has implications. An academic like me sure is going to look at it from a particular lens, but for practitioners like you, uh, the implications are quite profound just as well. Yeah, I mean, just as much. So traditionally, what used to happen is a data analysis, the analysis we would do would adapt to whatever form the data were available in. In other words, DA, data analysis, adapted to DC, data collection. DC, in turn, uh, the data collection task, adapted to data generation. Okay, the data are generated and written down in these fat, thick registers. Data collection would go in some sense, would be, you know, in some sense to, uh, what do you call that? Uh, transcribe that digitally. Yeah, data entry operators, we used to have them around the year 2000, and thereafter data analysis could proceed. But what 2007 onwards tells me is something fundamental changed, okay? Something profound happened. It seems the causal chain has been reversed. DG, data generation, appears to be adapting to DC, appears to be adapting to DA, okay? Hold on to that thought, this is big, okay? We'll come back to this, right? I mean. Classically in the program, so it's sure you have data and algos and all of that, sure you do, yeah. But it is also the business side that one has to be able to see in order to bring the two together and create value. Yeah, both of them go together. All right, uh, I am aware of time. I don't know how much I have, but I'll quickly, uh, yeah. Uh, I have a few more slides, so let me get that. Okay, quality and quantity. ML being machine learning, folks, how big a deal is data and machine learning? Yeah, I know it's a very big deal here. Yeah, let's put some more perspective on that. Okay, suppose I give you a choice. Poor choice, but there it is. Okay, the choice is between a poor ML algorithm and poor data. Which one would you choose? Yeah, I don't know. There's a chat window that can, oh, the chat thing is blinking. Uh, okay, no. All right, so I don't think I have a chat view here, but there it is. Which one will you choose? I asked this question in my class, and guess what? Almost everybody, almost everybody chose the first. I would rather go with a poor algorithm than with poor data, and they were right. Yeah, why is that? Let's have a look. Yeah, let's have a look. In a famous 2001 paper, Banco and Brill, these are Microsoft researchers, showed that very different ML algorithms, including some fairly simple ones, right, just correlational modeling, for instance, performed almost identically well on a complex problem, yeah, when given enough data, the enough being big data. So we are talking about something like a billion words of text. Here is basically the uh, the famous picture from that famous paper. Yeah, four different yeah algorithms. Perceptrons were slightly on the higher side. Memory based, naive based. Naive based is simple, simple correlation. In fact, the naive part tells me that you know oh I'm going to assume that based on this you know that conditional probabilities hold and independence amongst anything that is not conditioned upon. A very naive assumption, so to say. But guess what? Naive based performs quite well. Quite well, yeah. In fact, once you give enough data, the convergence, all algorithms, you know, even the simple ones or the complex ones tend to start converging towards the higher side, yeah. Which tells me that data is paramount. Data is paramount, yeah. Data matters more than algorithms, okay. But however, most data sets even today are small to medium size, okay. Particularly those will deal with the future in predictive analytics, for instance, yeah. But if you have to collect data through sampling or through field tests and surveys, I mean, typically data sets don't tend to be all that large to start off with. So don't jump the algos just yet. Okay. 
All right, so there it is. Mountains of data we have, not just from consumers, yeah, but also from within the firm's boundaries. I'm a marketing professor, folks, and hence, you know, don't uh, be surprised if I keep dragging in marketing domain here and there. All right, what kind of ML happens now? What kind of questions is business asking these days? It's very interesting. I mean, I could have all the tools in my repertoire, but end of the day, if I don't formulate my problem correctly, the business problem correctly, really, I will not be able to deliver value. Yeah, okay. So let me, in some sense, take you through my last example. I hope I have the time. Uh, organizers, please let me know if I'm overshooting time, I can stop right away. Sure, sir, no problem, we still have time. Okay, so let me go through my last example, yeah? So motivating example, new technology in DC. DC stands for data collection. It's one of the courses I teach, by the way. But I used to teach in AMP BA. So there it is. All right, Yanta, name the world's two largest industries in revenue terms, the two largest industries. Okay, a lot of people get this wrong, okay? But, well, Number one is agriculture, period. In terms of revenue, commodity markets out there, bigger than oil, by the way. Number two is not oil, not the energy market. It is actually construction. Yeah. How big is it? We are talking about $8 trillion per annum. This is, you know, uh, circa 2017, 18. Yeah. The second largest industry in revenue terms worldwide is remarkably inefficient. Okay, now that's a strong statement, yeah? But let me in some sense get into this. The average construction project, the average, okay, this is as per a McKinsey study, runs 80% over budget and 20 months behind schedule. Why, folks? Why? Yeah, bunch of things, of course, yeah? On the screen, on paper, in the architect's mind, in their CAD files, everything seems perfect. Okay. Everything seems perfect. However, on the ground and the dust and the mud, things are very different indeed. This is what the architect sees in their CAD files. I mean, hey, no rough edges anywhere. Everything is just where it should be. Yeah. However, on the ground, things are not always that clear cut. Right. And this difference between what seems to be happening versus what is actually happening, what should happen versus what actually happens is the reason for that inefficiency yeah that difference is three trillion dollars per annum then we've been talking millions and billions here and there and this is a trillion dollar question yeah three trillion dollars per annum what would be your solution suppose you are tasked with designing a solution Design it for any one average construction project, and then we can, you know, maybe scale it up something like that, right? Wide berth, broad canvas, start from scratch, right? Kind of a thing. Let's have a look at one of the new techs that are in this space and how they are helping, uh, you know, basically uh, overcome at least part of this challenge. An estimated 80 to 90% of information humans get is through vision. Yeah, which then asks, begs the question, can we visually superimpose what is against what should be on the site, right? So if there is a gap between what is and what should be, can I visually superimpose them and see? Yeah, will that reduce the inefficiency? Can I rapidly ID gaps, bottlenecks, deviations, issues? You bet we can, right? What you're seeing there is an example of augmented reality. Sure, yeah, augmented reality. Can we do even better? Turns out we can. Okay. Augmented reality is going to, in some sense, yeah, right on top of something else to make this happen. Yeah. So that is reality. Can I measure and map it better and in real time? Can we capture reality? Right. The DC part, data collection part, coming through. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's have a look at this. Showcase DC tool today: drones. Yeah. There it is. Quadcopter. Mm -hmm. In 2007, drone technology was still in the lab. 2007, 13 years ago, I and mean, to me it seems just like the other day, but not so long ago, just to you know. By 2012, five years later, it escaped the lab. I know, I mean, those are ominous kind of words, yeah, in the post-COVID era, but there it is. This is drone technology that escaped the lab. It was still expensive in 2012. Okay, it wasn't, you know, you and I, I mean, we could maybe buy one. 
institutions could buy one, I guess, but individuals, it was still on the expensive side. By 2017, another five years later, yeah, 10 years from 2007, you could go to Walmart and buy drones with good enough sensors, capabilities, and very important, cloud connect directly connects to the cloud for enterprise work. And I'll put two and two together and let's see what it does. Hmm. Let's see what it does. This, for instance, so it's 2009 ish, you know, DIY tech. So there it is. The first time I saw World Corporate Drone, folks, was in the movie Three Idiots, which incidentally was launched in 2009. That time, yeah. I come back to India, just then back to the US. 2009, this is DIY tech, which is do it yourself. And this market has grown slowly, I'm sure. Why? Because consumer market, which launched around you know 2012, took off. But what happened was 2014, that is a real story when it went commercial, it became a commercial tech. It wasn't some hobby, it wasn't some yeah, entertainment related toy, it became B2B and commercial. Yeah, by 2016, you could connect directly to the cloud. And so after 2016, the S-shape, actually, you can see the exponential growth take off once cloud connect and enterprise work became possible. Yeah. Drones also, well, have some pretty interesting uh, characteristics, right? So they are open hardware, okay, which means you're not locked into any one manufacturer with extensible apps. As with any app ecosystem, be it Android, be it Apple, yeah, new and imaginative users from third party developers will come in. Demand will be there. There will be varied, heterogeneous demand for new things, different things, and you will see creativity bloom happening right now with drones as well. Yeah. What enabled this revolution, right? So, what happened between 2012 and 2017 that didn't happen between 2007 and 2020? Right? Yeah. So here it is, what happened, and we'll see that, right? Astonishing speed of diffusion from lab to commercial. Okay, those 10 years are not the same. 2007 to 2012, it was still the low end of the S-curve. 2012 to 2017, something happened. It basically hit the exponential part of the curve. What happened? Yeah, the smartphone dividend in sensors. Smartphones by then had invested in a variety of sensors, which could, now be transported, teleported, you know, in some sense, borrowed into drones directly. If you just look at the kind of sensors that companies, the tech companies around the world invested in putting into smartphones, a direct beneficiary were drones. Yeah, were drones. Both reality capture as well as motion capture. This goes back to photogrammetry algos. Photogrammetry, by the way, dates back to the first use of photographs itself, and this is 19th century. Yeah, but there it is. This is close quarter photogrammetry, right? We are talking motion capture, reality capture. Think of patterns that can be analyzed. Okay, this is for a person walking, singing, jogging. I mean, why would you need this different issue? Okay, what is the use case we will come to see? Yeah, but in construction, for instance, photogrammetry would be hugely useful, right? Tie it in with uh, augmented reality. Assumption of connectivity. It is an assumption. It is a given now. I am assuming that whatever you give me will have connectivity to the cloud. More smartphone with propellers. Typically, you know, drones used to be thought of as an aeroplane without pilots, unmanned plane. Really, that's not it. The way to look at a drone today as a DC tool, certainly, is to think of it as a smartphone with propellers. Yeah, that's basically what it is. I mean, it's a better way to, in some sense, uh, visualize opportunities that come in along with it. Yeah. And as you can see, open hardware, so what will happen? Well, the investment in hardware will come down over time. From 2012 to 2017, as you can see, investment in hardware came down. Investments went up on the software side and the services side, basically. Yeah, there it is, the, the green part, right? It's more than 50% now. I mean, of course, way higher since then, but there it is. Yeah. And it was disruptive in a classical sense. And this goes back to business school or what we teach here, right? The econ basis for the cost quality frontier. Yeah. I mean, I won't get into this in the interest of time, but let's you know, proceed. Future will be less about drones and more about apps. There's what is called outboard intelligence. Right? I mean, the drone itself is too small really to carry its own intelligence with it. But the fact that it can be connected to the cloud gives it outboard intelligence pattern recognition at a scale that is otherwise not possible. So there you go. Yeah. 
Let me conclude this example. Data is paramount to unlock value either on the demand side or the supply side. And I realize I didn't cover the demand and supply sides, but then you know, MPBA will take you through the business part as well as the, the tech part. Yeah. The form of new data sources are changing rapidly. Yeah. More unstructured data, which will require supervised machine learning. Yeah. Calibration libraries. Actually, you know, so for instance, ISB has uh, what we call uh, an incubation center, right? It is just amazing. 90% is my guess, okay? And I have sat there evaluating some of the proposals that come through, pitches that come through for a spot on the incubator. Most of these, actually, the startups and so on, most of these are based on that. The main asset is that, this calibration library, right? We're building a library that would be unique to us, yeah? Most of it uses ML, most of it, you know, a lot of them use drones and so on, but there it is. Data is currency, anything valuable as a market, business models are adapting, and well, I'm not surprised, right? I mean, data is currency, and so you would actually see business models changing to fit that, yeah. Important new tech ecosystems in one domain impact DC in unrelated domains, yeah. And this is the smartphone dividend example, I mean, it just jumps out here, yeah. So let me conclude, why care about business analytics and the data sciences? Folks, without measurement, there is no data. Yeah, without DC, there is no measurement either, I guess. Without data, there is no analysis. What will we analyze, right? Without analysis, there is no modeling. Yeah. And what happens if you're not able to model something? Model gives us two things. Okay, modeling effectively gives us two things. It gives us explanation and or prediction. Yeah. Without explanation, there is no insight, and without prediction, there is no optimization. If I can't predict if this input, then that output, then really I can't optimize my inputs at all. Without insight and without optimization, really there is no management. I mean, you could, you could pick up a person off the street and make them a manager, and they would do just as well as the best manager in the world if optimization and insight were not criteria for evaluation. Yeah. Well, with that, I will conclude my presentation. Thank you all for a patient here. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sudhir. Uh, it was really insight of you and giving us stark examples on how to connect data with the end, end management outcome. Uh, I do request you to stay back and we would have a quick and a uh, after uh, Mr. Jayateep's session. So folks, oh. uh, uh, we, we would have our uh, next uh, presenter for uh, today's session, uh, Mr. Jayadeep uh, Datta. So good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for having me uh, in this masterclass. Uh, I'll give a brief background of my journey uh, in data science and in the analytics space. And then uh, I think today, I think out of all the topics, uh, I thought I'll uh, talk to you a bit about the AI imperative, right? So brief background about me uh, and how and my more importantly, you know, my journey in data science. So I graduated uh, in 2001 um, uh, as a in as a B.Tech in computer science. And uh, those were not the best of our days because the dot com bubble had burst. But uh, I was lucky enough to get a campus uh, selection in TCS Data consultancy services. Um, and I started my career uh, there. So. From day one of my career, I uh, started working in the data space. So in those time, in those days, uh, uh, you know, it was the time of data warehouses or the age of data warehouses, right? So it still is uh, in a way, but you know, at that time there was no uh, no uh, such thing as big data. Even if it was there, you know, we were not actually utilizing it, right? So it was more around structured data, around data warehouses. How can draw insights? Uh, by creating data warehouses and data marts. And, and that is the area I started working in um, back there in 2001, 2002, right? So uh, I moved on from uh, TCS to HP in 2010. And then I started my second part of the data journey, which was uh, designing uh, enterprise data platforms for information management, right? So. At that time, I was uh, designing some of the uh, largest platforms for banking industry uh, for uh, the one of the largest banks in India, as well as uh, quite a few foreign and uh, international banks. So uh, as a chief data architect, as I was saying, uh, 
so back in 2010 uh, i started uh, a new role as a chief data architect uh, working on uh, designing enterprise uh, plat for data platforms for information management for large banks and around around that same time uh, there were two changes that were happening in the industry um, or rather you know uh, one that was already uh, kind of uh, past the formative year so one was the big data uh, change you know so we we were able to at that point as uh, from a data standpoint we were able to capture data from a variety of uh, devices uh, variety of channels and uh, there was a, the the explosion of data had started right so so telecom companies had started gathering data from their networks uh, from the call records or cdrs as they are called uh, we had uh, lots of sensors in in the manufacturing uh, industry in their in their appliances that were also generating a lot of data and and big data had arrived right and the other change that was uh, happening and uh, don't get me wrong data science has been there for a long time but the application of data science to utilize and draw insights from from big data that particular change was you know started uh, had started happening around that time right so big data science was always there we always used forecasting models uh, in in various forms uh, but to utilize data science to draw insights from big data that was the change that was happening uh, around that time and what i felt is uh, that i already had a very good uh, understanding and knowledge if i may say of how to manage and, and uh, make use of data and and also of the descriptive analytics right what we now call as descriptive analytics right so i felt there was uh, the piece that was missing was uh, around learning some of these predictive and prescriptive learning tools and technologies right so with that intention i started to search for a uh, formal learning program uh, or a course uh, that would help me uh, with my objective and the things that were that i was looking for in in such a, a program were uh, like four things i would say one was that it would give me a strong uh, foundation in data science so i i firmly believe that uh, little knowledge is a dangerous thing so un unless you have the uh, basics right under you who have a strong foundation um, you only see one side of the story the story that uh, you are trying to build not the story that you know is out there for uh, for everybody to discover right uh, so that was the first thing that i was looking for uh, a strong foundation in data science uh, second thing uh, obviously uh, i being a practitioner in the industry uh, i wanted uh, the program to be industry relevant uh, of course there are so many uh, courses uh, that are out there that were out there at that time which were giving a foundation on data science but without the industry uh, industry perspective right so I, that was another key criteria that i had uh, the third was uh, you know uh, and uh, again very important one for me is i didn't want to leave my full time job uh, that i was doing uh, and i want to learn wanted to learn along with uh, continuing my professional career so i needed that flexibility uh, that that, uh, that I should get in in such a program, and finally, um, I think uh, another key thing was uh, I wanted to join a program which would have a strong peer group that I could learn from, and a strong alumni network. So, so searching through all the uh, options available at that point. I found uh, the MPBA program that ISP uh, has as the most perfect fit for my uh, my priorities, right? And uh, I'm I'm honored and proud to say that I am the I've been part of the founding batch of that program. It was called CBA back then, and and all the things that I just said, right? So the program uh, has been uh, designed to. To cater to at least you know all the priorities that i had which is a strong foundation in data science it's industry level event uh, we had a lot of case studies industry case studies a capstone project at the end which was given by the industry um, 
a strong peer group learning so my roommate was a, a guy a commander in the navy right so he was a retired navy commander right so uh, you know it's not just about uh, what you are learning on the educational background there are a lot of life lessons to be learned in in such a program as well right so and then obviously it gave me the flexibility to uh, have all these benefits in a part time program right so coming out of that program uh, uh, you know uh, i was uh, then looking for a, uh, a change in role that would allow me to utilize these new acquired newly acquired skills and help me move in the uh, data science uh, domain right so at that point deloitte was looking for uh, someone who could uh, incubate and and start their uh, intelligent automation practice right so uh, so at that point you know i had had a, had a it was a long journey of uh, 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 discussions at deloitte because deloitte being a consulting firm the process is quite rigorous and uh, at the end of six months you know uh, uh, I, I i finally joined deloitte and i'm happy to say that the objective that i joined for uh, you know uh, and which deloitte also had uh, a priority on that you know we wanted to build a practice uh, which is focusing on new new world problems right so uh, in, in even in the automation space right so we are working on problems that are more cognitive in nature and uh, that are more um, ai driven um, along with you know some some problems that are more traditional as well uh, not to say we don't work in that space but you know that that's how my journey has been so i think uh, that's all i wanted to talk about my journey but i think you know two or three things that i felt are very relevant for a career in data science uh, or if you want to be in space right so one is i think professor volity already touched upon is that data so uh, most of the ai cognitive data science algorithms whatever you, you use cases you work on 80 70 to 80 percent of the work is in Manu uh, cleaning and and making the data ready right so so that that is one key uh, uh, skill i would i'd urge all of you to uh, to pick up because uh, you are as good a data scientist as good you know not just because you can write fancy or we can write fancy algorithms but because we have a good understanding of data we know how to take things out of the sandbox and and make it practical in the real world right only then it will work and uh, second is keeping an industry perspective or a business perspective so while you know uh, we can write the most fanciest algorithm possible if it doesn't solve a business problem uh, it has limited practical use right so so keeping these two uh, these two aspects in mind and picking up these two, these two skills is really important to make sure that we are able to draw the insights that we look uh, for with our skills as a data scientist otherwise it's more like r and python programming right at the end of the day uh, but but that's not we are trying to become right good r and python programmers right we are aiming to become uh, data scientists who can solve real world problems right so i think uh, that's all i had uh, uh, i had a few uh, uh, things that i wanted to share on the ai side of things how you know um, means because i work on these problems like chatbots and all and how if we don't add the uh, augment human uh, intelligence with with whatever we are building in the ai side it becomes artificial stupidity right as 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 i like to call it right so um, but unfortunately i'm not able to share my screen uh, but i think i hope uh, whatever i spoke through of my journey in this space uh, is useful and i'm happy to answer any questions that you have uh, on this sure jay thank you thank you for your talk uh, so folks so we, we would have we have some time for a quick uh, q and a session for all the three speakers of the session uh, there is there is obviously a chat option that's available uh, on the control panel that you would see through which uh, you can ask questions and we can pick it up from there and have uh, some of these speakers uh, get respond get their responses uh, on their uh, perspective on this uh, i think there are already a few questions and i would like to uh, uh, read them out and uh, uh, 
I, I would request uh, e either one of the speakers to jump in uh, and uh, you know, uh, answer those. Uh, I think there's a first question uh, by uh, Muthu Krishnan. Uh, and his question is that uh, he has uh, eight years of uh, IT, ex IT experience and currently is a cloud developer. Uh, uh, and he's also interested to gain knowledge on data science and analytics, but he's got a doubt on the career path now, whether he should pursue uh, his career in the cloud uh, domain itself, or should he really switch to data science considering it's a booming technology and there's a lot of scope of uh, you know, applications of data, etc. So, uh, what would be a, a suggestion? Uh, whether should he continue in cloud or should he switch to data science uh, uh, currently? Uh, Mr. Jaydeep, uh, Jaydeep, would you be able to uh, answer that question? Sure, sure. So, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get the name of the. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, so Muthu Krishnan, my perspective uh, being in consulting would be that you know uh, the real value comes when you can combine multiple tools and technologies to deliver a business outcome. So cloud at the end of the day is is a platform that helps you uh, to uh, to host things or uh, in a more agile and 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 a more efficient manner, right? data science is about you know solving problems business problems with with outcomes right so if you can combine uh, the learning that you have in cloud plus plus what you uh, the machine learning algorithms that we build that, that would be you know how i would look at it uh, see one of the things that i uh, you asked a very pertinent question in that sense you cannot don't expect to just learn something and switch a career right uh, that's not you should be able to blend it in whatever you are doing so if I, i'll take a different example just to illustrate so if you're working in the cyberspace right so cyberspace now is increasingly using artificial intelligence right so if you already know the business uh, have the business understanding of cyber and you are able to un, uh, pick up data science skills then you will be able to solve those uh, business problems right similarly i would say is that even in your role, whatever you are doing, look for or how you can blend in data science to solve some of the problems in your industry, right? And then I think that will make it more effective. I hope I uh, uh, was able to give you some perspective on how to think about it. Yes, yes, sure, sure, Jayde. I'm sure uh, uh, that was also very uh, you know, insightful answer that you gave. It's always good to continue uh, uh, in the current field uh, which they are in and they're doing doing good at rather than keep uh, you know switching uh, domains i think that's a good thought uh, I, I think there's another question from uh, shiv kumar uh, his question uh, it goes like this as to uh, why are we not able to predict or prevent uh, npas i think he's referring to non performing assets uh, after all these years of doing data science in the banking industry specifically So, uh, if you like, I can repeat this question. No, no, I got it. Uh, so, Subhashish, uh, I think that is something that I think maybe. Uh, yeah, I'll pick that up. Give Thanks. Thanks, Jadhav. Yeah, I'll pick yeah. that up. Yes. So, see, yeah. uh, NPA actually happens because of a lot of uh, reasons, right? So, see, uh, mathematical modeling or data science is uh, based on algorithms. So, uh, this is based on uh, data that we get. Now, see, NPS can happen because of uh, change in consumer behavior. There are certain external factors which you are not able to model the change in economy or even, even uh, the person's, uh, say, economic situation. If you take the personal financial services, someone uh, actually uh, going bankrupt um, has a lot of uh, uh, different e um, external influences. For Even for a company uh, kind of going uh, bust, uh, there are a lot of stuff uh, which uh, are external influences uh, related to economy and supply chain and uh, the quality of the management uh, and things like that. So, so the data science uh, is as effective as the uh, data that you put in, right? Garbage in, garbage in, garbage out. So as long as you are able to use the relevant data, it gives you a, a kind of a good uh, prediction. But uh, see, as we all understand as students of mathematical sciences that there is only one part of uh, 
uh, phenomena that you can model there are certain uh, white noise which is always there of course the uh, endeavor is to minimize the noise as much as possible uh, but uh, NP is also uh, kind of the cost of uh, doing business so for uh, from a banking industry as a banking professional NPA is uh, also the cost of uh, doing the banking business that uh, the bankers will have to take uh, so that's how it goes so it's actually depending upon what information that you are putting into the uh, algorithm because at the end of the day uh, these algorithms are idiot boxes right so it is actually on the data scientists and the quality of the data uh, which creates these outputs and and okay. just to uh, yes. add to what subhashi shared you know data science algorithms today are able to predict and prevent nps so it's not that you know we are not preventing nps or defaults on credit cards uh, we are able to predict that through the customer's behavior but uh, as uh, again subhashi said that you know there are some things outside the boundary uh, maybe geopolitical reasons or other reasons that come into play and and there's a certain amount of risk that banks agree to take right uh, in in a loan right so that that is still causing npas right? okay okay thank you ajay thank you Shubhashi. so there's a next question from uh, gurang but uh, he, he says that he has recently uh, uh, moved his company and which is a global MNC for IT to analytics directly as a manager. Uh, and uh, he, he says uh, his functional uh, background is finance. How much of a technical knowledge uh, would he need to learn to manage teams and projects as well as analytics uh, in his organization? Uh, so somebody who's got uh, finance as a, a major background uh, how much of a technical stuff you would need to uh, learn to manage uh, teams and projects of analytics? So, uh, um, if I can take that question. Uh, so, I think uh, uh, you already have the one critical piece of the pie sorted, right? Which is the business uh, understanding or the functional understanding, right? Which is very critical uh, to combine with the technology skill, right? So, without it, it's, it's just a black. Uh, just not relevant right whatever you have so the other pieces that you will need to pick up uh, is uh, uh, the fundamentals of data science the fundamentals of data um, get some strong background on how these algorithms work and how are these projects run right so what what goes into running a analytics project right right from uh, the data part of it collecting the data part of it to uh, to building the mo model part of it to deploying it uh, from a sandbox in a, in a production environment right so if you are able to learn these skills along with the business skills that you already have uh, i think you will uh, you will be uh, able to efficiently manage the teams that are working with you uh, on these uh, use cases or on these initiatives right okay okay thank you jaydev uh, there's another question from uh, Anjit Jain. Uh, his question is, uh, how can he overcome challenges as a data scientist, uh, you know, as data scientists face to make business understand the value of his model or dashboard, uh, which will deliver uh, a successful business outcome? So he's looking at, you know, how, how can data scientists overcome this challenge to make business understand what they have created actually makes business sense? I, I can I can take a dig on that. Uh, then Jadev uh, uh, and uh, Professor, you guys can uh, kind of add in. So see, uh, you are as good uh, as the value that you generated right in your last project. So uh, see, most of these uh, places where uh, you are doing this, these are not charitable organizations, right? People are looking uh, value and they are looking at return on investment. So from that perspective, uh, you may have uh, the fanciest of algorithms and uh, uh, very technical jargons everywhere in a presentation, but it really uh, doesn't uh, kind of uh, bump up the bottom line or, or the top line, um, then it is of no use, right? So uh, the, the, the real uh, trick of uh, creating effective uh, data science projects is that translating the business uh, problem into the data science problem, solving it uh, as the data science problem and translating it back in value terms to business 
in layman's language, uh, which everyone understands. And that's why a, a critical skill for data science professionals is also your ability to articulate and your storytelling capability is not only about technical stuff. So, so if uh, you are able to solve a problem uh, effectively, then you should also be able to uh, show the value that it adds, uh, how you have improved the as is process to the improved process and what benefit it brings in. You just need to ensure that that is articulated correctly rather than getting lost in jargons and technical equations. That's the trick of it. Okay. Okay. Chaitiv, you would have a point on this? Uh, just, I think uh, Subhashish, you covered uh, it uh, well, but I just wanted to add, as long as there is a business outcome, the business does not care what you are running in, in, in your own fancy uh, machines, right? So all they care about is the outcome. So if there is a business outcome, then, then definitely you will get the traction or the support that you need from business. If I'm building a churn algorithm, but I'm not seeing any any benefit or any upliftment, then then you know it it won't it won't sell, right? So if you are able to deliver a business outcome, focus therefore while formulating the problem, don't focus it as a data science or an engineering problem. Focus it as a business outcome. You know what is the outcome that you want to derive from that exercise? If you that is clear at the start of whatever you do. I think you you will be able to see uh, much uh, uh, support from your business users. Okay, okay. Thank you, Jay. Uh, there's another question from uh, Ranjan. Uh, his question is, uh, I think he's trying to uh, ask if the ability to practice and have more practical approach is best suited for uh, this data science domain, or should he? look at uh, you know going through a curriculum and a course first and then proceed into uh, the practice mode and then uh, moving into the domain which approach is best suited for for him uh, Sib, uh, i think it is said that uh, the best learning happens on the job right so uh, that's why there is always a 70 20 10 model right where 70 percent of uh, real efficacy comes in uh, on your hands-on working. Uh, having said that, I think a uh, basic understanding of uh, the um, data science domain uh, is important. So I think uh, while uh, someone is working hands-on and trying to uh, kind of uh, understand uh, the concepts, a little bit of uh, theoretical background, a little bit of academic uh, study is going to surely uh, help anchor it. Uh, but um, uh, it's it's uh, really a fact that you can't uh, learn swimming sitting out of the water. So the real uh, learning actually ha happens. The concepts become more clear when you actually make your hands dirty with data. Okay, okay. Uh, I, I think uh, that that's a good point what you made, uh, Shwashis. So next, next we have a question from uh, Shiv Prakash uh, and. Uh, you know, I think his, his question is, uh, is to Professor Sudhir. Professor Sudhir, if you can hear us. Uh, uh, he, he's asking if you could uh, share, uh, you know, your, your thoughts on given the blockbuster data, what you showcased in as an example, uh, what prediction could have prevented it from going back wrong? You know, back, bankrupt, sorry. Hello, am I audible? Yeah, yes, Mr. Uh, Professor Sudhir. Would yeah, you like to yeah. me to repeat the question? Sure, no, I, I heard the question. If you could just tell me the uh, questioner's name. Yeah, uh, his name is uh, Shiva Prakash. Uh, hi, Shiva Prakash. So yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's a very good question indeed. Uh, so basically, there's a bunch of things that would go through. Uh, you would have to look at this as a business problem and not purely as a data science problem. Yeah, I mean, you could take all the data that, for instance, uh, Blockbuster had with them. Yeah. And we could, in some sense, predict the shape of the curve. Well, we see revenues dipping and they may continue to dip. But unless we know why the revenues are dipping, which would imply that the data collection effort would go beyond the structured data that the blockbuster might already have and go into unstructured data. Okay, This could include uh, qualitative uh, data, interviews with the managers, uh, interviews with customers. Uh, there is uh, an entire marketing research function market intelligence function that basically tries to see which way things are moving all of these 
become predictors in this grand model that we are building, throw the kitchen sink at it and see what predictors finally survive this Darwinian process of connecting it with a supervised dependent variable, right? So whichever survives that, those are the best predictors. Now, the issue with data science, pretty much like what we have, you know, technical analysis in stock markets. I mean, maybe I can take these curves and try to extrapolate them here and there, but we wouldn't know why. The, the why part actually comes from business understanding, which is why in some sense, a lot of the value to be created, one has to go beyond just the technical data science problem and also look at the surrounding business context in which the problem is uh, situated. I'm not sure if uh, that, you know, uh, but I, in general, I mean, that's the, that's, the, uh, that's the direction I would take. And I, you could take the data that Blockbuster gives you, but you know it could happen that none of it is a strong predictor. In which case, you have to expand your search. I mean, it's an ocean of data out there. The question is, where do we catch fish, right? So basically, what are the predictors that would best, in some sense, explain a particular outcome? Yeah. I hope okay. that answers. Yes, Professor. And while we have you, uh, there's another question from Sanjeev Mathur. Uh, he, I think he's making reference to the uh, drones as an example that you made in your presentation. So his mm -hmm. question is in terms of using drones for uh, measurement, visualization, etc. for private use. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, where do you think uh, we are with respect to the uh, policy? Do you see a policy hurdle in delaying this drone technology adoption at all with, with regards to India? A very good question and true. Yeah, so we have issues, uh, regulatory obstacles in India. Uh, I think it's sad, yeah. Uh, I understand there are uh, privacy and security concerns and so on, but at least in certain, I don't know, green zones, uh, universities, uh, tier two and three towns, uh, far away from you know any uh, security hazard, one should allow people to start experimenting and exploring and creatively remixing applications with drones at the extent, the amount of progress that China has made, for instance, uh, that the US, of course, which has a very strong DIY culture, and tech culture anyway, we have one too. I mean, it's just about letting, you know, I think there is a balance to be made. I understand that the government has its concerns, uh, you know, privacy and security related primarily, but uh, somewhere a balance has to be found and we have to allow these productivity, efficiency, enhancing tools and who knows what else might come tomorrow. One of the most exciting things about these new technologies, they borrow from unrelated domains. So the way the path of their evolution is very hard to predict. Yeah. And uh, missing the boat now is, uh, you know, uh, yeah, it just makes it harder to catch up later on. So there is that tournament model effect that happens with a digital business more generally. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I know academic kind of answer, but you know, I hope that uh, that answers uh, at least part of the question. Sure, Professor. Thank you. Uh, so I think uh, we are almost, uh, you know, inching closer to the session. I think uh, we can conclude with a closing remark uh, from all the three speakers. Uh, if there is any last minute advice that you would like to give our attendees uh, today uh, who are present and also, you know, how they can embrace uh, the challenges that they could they would face uh, going forward and how they can overcome those challenges and be successful uh, any closing remarks from the speakers would be welcome i think i think the only thing yeah. uh, that i will uh, perhaps uh, say to the aspiring data scientists is that uh, strengthening the basics uh, start hands-on uh, kind of uh, work on uh, even small assignments right uh, even academic assignments gives you exposures and builds up your confidence and familiarity with uh, this uh, vast ocean of uh, data science and uh, i think uh, it's also important uh, that you kind of pursue your interest uh, uh, be kind of uh, cognizant of the trends uh, that's happening uh, the changes that's happening and uh, uh, make the best out of the um, opportunities that's coming your way. Okay, thank you, Shubhashish. Uh, uh, Jayadev, would you have any closing suggestions for our attendees? 
um i i think only one thing to keep in mind is you know outcome 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 <laughs> just like entertainment 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 so for every yeah. data science problem that you work on uh, think of the outcome uh, or the impact that uh, it it has to make and then start working backwards on solving that problem right and all the best uh, for your journey on this uh, domain if you have any questions for the questions i'll be happy to take them offline as well Sure. Thanks, sure. Thank you, Jaydev. Professor, would you have a closing remark for our attendance? Uh, yeah, sure. A uh, couple of lines, basically. So, uh, yeah. data science is a emerging, uh, you know, toolbox that is horizontal in nature. So it cuts across different verticals. I mean, you could be in oil and gas, you could be in banking, you could be in uh, the services sector, and data science would have applications across the board. Yeah. But for aspiring data scientists, uh, the way I look at it, uh, great value in some sense can be created if you combine this horizontal expertise with at least one or two vertical domain uh, you know, expertise as well. I mean, uh, otherwise, there is this risk of commoditization that may happen at some point down the line. So basically, it is this combination of a vertical uh, domain and uh, you know, a horizontal uh, skill set that I guess would uh, uh, you know serve in some sense to de-risk uh, uh, you know uh, professional uh, you know once professional uh, moves career-wise uh, you know at least into the uh, medium term uh, to long-term future. I mean at least that is what I believe. Thanks. Thank you, Professor. So, folks, uh, I, I think you heard it from all our, our all our three uh, speakers today uh, that it is very critical for you to you know. Uh, focus on the uh, you know, right tactics and also focus on uh, having the right skill set and knowledge so that you become successful and overcome any hurdles that life throws at you. I'm sure the current situation uh, is no less challenging, but I'm sure this is a temporary case and I'm sure all of us would be much successful if we implement our time energies or at the, the right way. So uh, with that, I would like to uh, once again thank all our uh, session speakers, Mr. Shubhashish, Shimana, uh, thank you very much for having taken time off your schedule and uh, attend the session and have some of these answers uh, for the attendees that were present. Uh, and uh, Mr. Jaydev, uh, thank you once again for being part of the session and Professor, uh, as always, a pleasure to have you at our sessions. So thank you once again. Have a good day. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.